was I not supposed to come up here this early? <laughs> You're going to want to turn your Bibles to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. I just want to share a thought with you in, in trying to get us on the same page this morning for what I believe is a very powerful passage for us. And maybe many of us here tonight or today have this, uh, this situation that they're dealing with going on in our lives. Uh, it's funny, the uh, thing about life isn't it that we find ourselves off course, very seldom often consider reversal as the right direction to take. It's just human nature to assume that we've been already, where we've been already was a good choice and all we need to do to make things right is to make small, minor or small adjustments and not change. To admit that we've been wrong and change our path altogether is often far too hurtful to our egos to consider. In this passage today, uh, it calls some men who had been doing it uh, in many different ways towards the Lord, uh, following God. It calls them to respond in His presence. And that's really the concept that I want to focus on today. So the question I have for us, I'm going to ask this now, I want to ask you to give when we're done. I want you to ask, ask this question of yourselves throughout the week, but what is the proper response to an encounter with Christ? Now I know for a fact that, that many in here today would say, I want to have a passionate and real encounter with Jesus Christ every moment of every day. And I believe that. But sometimes we've gotten ourselves in a place where we wouldn't even know what that looks like anymore. We, we find ourselves wondering what would happen if Christ was right here with us all of a sudden. How would I respond? Or what would be the proper response? And this passage, I think today, helps us to understand uh, what that is. So I want you to stand with me. We're going to read the first few verses of John chapter 21, starting in verse 1. After these things, Jesus manifested Himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And He manifested Himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana, in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, We also will come with you. And they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side, our right hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Heavenly Father, I pray that you guide us in your word. We would understand that, Lord, how we respond when your presence says a lot about who we serve and where our focus is. I pray that that would be the heart of our passage today, is us to get to a place where we seek. And desire your presence in everything that we do. God is direct us, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now I want to set the table, if I can, for this passage we just read. Jesus has gone to the cross. He died upon the cross. He rose from the grave. And now he finds himself going from one place to another, showing himself or revealing himself to those who he would recent or most uh, soon. Give him, you know, give the, the control, the leadership of the church. He's leaving soon to go be with God. And he's doing some stops along the way to charge or re-energize the heart for what God will do. But I also want to tell you this because I think it's very important. This is not the first time that these men in this story have had an encounter like this. I want you to go all the way back and I want you to look at the book of Luke. And I want specifically Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Now this is just as Jesus is, is beginning His ministry. He's going out and He's doing some things here. But in verse chapter 5 of Luke, verse 1, it says, Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, 
he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. And when they had done this, they closed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them, and they came and filled the boats, uh, filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement has seized him, all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So for three years, the men from that boat experience followed Jesus. And you know the stories of these. John at the cross being given uh, the lead to Jesus' mother. Care for her. Simon Peter, who would go on at a late night fire to deny Christ three times. Find themselves here in this place with exactly the same experience. But I want to point out to you again from John chapter 21. Verse 4, if you go back and look now, having seen Luke. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Now, now, some AR have argued and, and talked about the fact that because the sun was now breaking, it was early morning, maybe there was fog and, and visibility wasn't that good, and that very well could be part of the problem here. But I also want to share with you, to stipulate if I can, that these men who had experienced Jesus every day for three years find themselves in a place where they're wondering what my faith would look like or how would I react in the presence of Jesus? And I want to share with you just a few things. Now, before you get too caught up, I want to also point this out if I can. Jesus, when he was getting ready to die, told his disciples, you're going to see me again. Yet they had gone back to fishing. That means they had left, laid down their calling, they had put it aside, and they had gone back to the familiar and maybe some of us here today have done the same. We, we find ourselves out there and we find ourselves, uh, you know, having had a, a, an intimate relationship with Christ, but over the years we've seemed to have drifted away. We find ourselves farther from God today than we were even two weeks ago or two months or two years ago. We wonder, how can I get back to that place? And that's why I shared that illustration at the beginning, because sometimes... We'd say, if I just make some small corrections or some little changes, eventually I'll work my way over to where Jesus is. I've been told by people, I'm just not ready for Jesus, but when I am, I know where to find Him. But the reality is that we cannot be that kind of a person if He is who He says He is. The Jesus who encountered them in the book of Luke chapter 5. Is the same Jesus who walked with them every day. They saw His miracles, they heard His teachings, and they understood. But even in this place, after His death and resurrection, they were still missing something. Something was missing. And we find ourselves here today in 2015, in this church maybe, and we say, you know, deep down inside, I don't know something's missing. The encounter with Christ, I don't know what exactly what it is. I'm missing something. And this passage is for us. But Jesus didn't leave them wondering where he would be either, by the way. Because if you go back in uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 7, you'll see that it records Jesus who tells, uh, the angels tell the woman, go back. Uh, Jesus, the tomb is empty. The angels know uh, that Jesus is gone. And they tell the women, go back to the disciples and tell them that Jesus has gone on ahead of them to the area of Galilee. They've gone on ahead. 
So Jesus tells them that he's going to be, through the angel, he's going to be at Galilee for an encounter. <coughs> and yet still here at Galilee, the one occurrence we have in the scripture of Jesus, post-resurrection. The one encounter we have. And he's there. And they're there. And they don't recognize him. But look at verse 6 again in 7 of John chapter 21. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find a catch. So they cast and they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on for his strip for work. And he threw himself into the sea. And I see my first point in this verse that we must acknowledge him. What was it about John that saw the Lord when all the others didn't quite identify who he was? And I started thinking about that. I started trying to study. What, what was it about John? I mean, Peter was with him. The sons of Zebedee, they were with him, right? They, all these disciples that were with him. What was it about John that helped him to recognize Christ when everybody else wasn't quite seeing exactly who it is. And you wonder about that, right? You, you've seen that person in church. And you wonder to yourself, what is it about them? They just always seem to have it together. A little more than I do. You ever know anybody like that? They're, they're, they're out there. And you just wonder. And I think it is because they see Jesus a little more clearly than her. And I want to be that person. So I started looking at Scripture <clears throat> excuse me, to find out what it was about this John. You can turn with me if you want, back in John chapter 18. John chapter 18, verse 15. Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest. And it were Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. That other disciple was John, the one whom Jesus loved. He was known by the high priest and by the court. He was known as the disciple with Jesus. Peter was not. Peter finds himself not being allowed into the temple because he was not recognized. And it was John who had the clout with the enemies of Christ to go and get Peter and bring him in with Jesus. And so it makes me say to myself, okay, I get it. One of the reasons why John recognized Jesus is because he was always with him. And you want to have a relationship where God moves mightily in your life? You had better spend your time with Jesus. You want to stand out in the crowd as someone who loves the Lord? You better spend time with Jesus. If you want to have a deep and intimate relationship with your personal Lord and Savior, it's not going to happen because you have knowledge up here that assists you or puts you on a different plane than others. It's going to be because you always spend your time with your Lord and Savior. But it wasn't just that thing. Look at verse 9, or chapter 19, verse 25. 19.25. The worst day for Jesus on earth. The worst day. 1925. Therefore the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sisters, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw them, Jesus saw then, saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciples took her into his own household. So I said, Well, what is it about John that, that helped him recognize Jesus when others didn't? It, it was because John had always been willing to recognize Jesus. He didn't just do it in words, but his actions. You know, we've got a lot of ministries that are coming up this year. We know about them already because they, they're ongoing. VBS. Uh, I, our Harvest Fest, almost an October Fest. Harvest Fest! We celebrate Harvest Fest! 
Somebody else might celebrate October, but not us. <laughs> Where's my deacons? <laughs> they get serving with me. <laughs> We're going to want to scratch that, baby. <laughs> I don't want my mom to see that. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. Woo. Lordy. How's he doing down there? He's smiling like crazy and he listen to that preacher up there. <laughs> I don't know where I was. <laughs> I think we were talking about Jesus and John. John chapter 19. So they're at the cross. The worst possible day for Jesus. And at that moment, at that very moment, John is most tuned in. All the weeping widows and all the sad wives, mothers, all the situations going on in that place. And Jesus calls upon his beloved disciples to take care of some very important needs. You want to know how you get closest to the Lord, how you recognize Him in the midst of the storm of life? Will you serve Him? And Matt, could you use some extra help this year at VBS? Last year, you were just getting ready to go full-time. This year, you're full-time working. You're going to need people not just to step up a little, but people to take over some things for you. In church, you want to know where Jesus is and how to get closer to him? I'll take on a role like that. Any of our Sunday school teachers need a little help in their class? A little more participation in their class? You want to know how to get close and locked in with Jesus? Get involved in a small group. I am loving our small group that we started a couple weeks ago. Having a blast with it. Because we're opening God's word, we're laughing together, and we're studying. And I believe it's drawing us all nearer to God. And in relation to that, it's drawing us nearer to Him. Christians should be involved in a small group. In every way, Sunday school is vital to our nourishment of our soul and encouragement of the body. So he was giving care of the mother of Jesus. So he knew. He was known in the family, but he knew the family. He had spent time there. One more example, if I can, just to kind of help you with John and understanding why John saw him and recognized him when others did not. But in verse chapter 20, verse 4, the two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter. And he came to the tomb first. And stopping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came, following him, and entered the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. So he, had, he was there, and he was racing to the tomb. I think he was racing to the tomb in anticipation of what Jesus had been saying all along. Hey, I'm getting ready to go. I'm going to die on the cross. But there's going to come a moment when I rise. And when he heard from the women that the tomb was empty, I think he raced ahead of Simon because he was most excited to find out what God's next step was. And church, let me tell you something. You had better be excited about what God's next step is. Or I promise you that the last exciting step you saw him take will be the last exciting step you see him take. The reality is that our church had better be focused on what God is doing, not what he's done. We better be focused on the next step and focused on the next heart and the next soul, the next address. We better be focused on the next thing and race forward to see where God is at. And when we get that way, we're going to find ourselves in the midst of what God is going to do. And we're going to be able to see how God moves mightily. And in doing so, we're going to get real close with Jesus. Because it is a roller coaster, scary type ride when you run on the front of that edge like that, that with God. <clears throat> so, amazing. John, it's not, this is not rocket science. John recognized Jesus because John's world was Jesus. Jesus wasn't a priority in John's schedule. Jesus was John's priority. Everything else that Jesus was, or that John did, happened flowing out of his relationship with God. And so when it came time, in kind of a blurry state, in a tough place, when he looked up, he saw what everybody else did. You want to be that person? You get on board. Well, let's look ahead. Chapter 21 again. Verse 9. 
So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Can I, I just want to point out something. I want you to write, if you take your notes, I want you to write off the side. Verse 9, charcoal fire. This verse is only used twice in Scripture, and this is one of those two times. And I believe it is very important to the message of Jesus to us here today. And we're going to get back to it at the end of the service. But I don't want you to miss this. That is an important part. We're going to come back to it. So in verse 9, they go out of the land and saw the charcoal fire already laid on the fish and placed on it and the bread. It's already prepared. And I see that we must fellowship with Jesus. Meal had been prepared. There was going to come a time. Now I want you to turn back with me verse 8. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging a net full of fish. So when John saw him in verse 7, the other disciples began to row the boat in to the shore. Because along with that, they saw that fellowship had been set up. Because John recognized them and told them, that's the Lord, there were no more questions. Now I want you to go one more verse back up. Verse 7, we just read a little bit ago. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his iron garments on. Okay, I want you to understand this. He was probably working uh, in, in some type of uh, girded up loin, wrapped around his waist and all that. He wasn't naked. He was working, and he was working in the water, so they would have had short type stuff of that era. But proper greeting in the Jewish tradition would have been to be dressed before he met someone important. So the first thing Peter does when he does find out that it's Jesus is he gets himself in a proper way to greet the Lord. And let me tell you something, church. Getting in a proper way to meet the Lord requires reading His Word. It requires setting up a personal time and preparing to have an encounter with Jesus. There will come those times when your encounter with Jesus happens off the cuff and it blows your mind. But I want you to understand it's okay to get prepared to meet Him every day. Church, we should set aside a time to be with our Lord. We should set aside a time to participate in a devotional of some sort with Jesus Christ. All the other stuff of life is important, but if you don't get this first thing right, everything else isn't going to have quite the meaning or the importance. But it, it, verse 8 didn't leave you there as if that wouldn't have been enough. The Bible says, or verse 7 I mean, not that he was just stripping and that he girded himself up. It also says he threw himself into the sea. Anybody wonder what that meant? If you don't read verse 8 and see that the boat is heading into shore, you might not understand the importance of Peter jumping out of the boat. If you go back to Acts chapter 5 and you find Peter, he runs to the foot of Jesus. And then in John chapter 21, Peter, the same one, jumps out of the boat because he's too eager to wait for that slow boat to get to the shore. So he closes himself up and he jumps over the side of the boat to race to Jesus. Now it's not a coincidence because Peter's not been in a good place. Right? He just denied Christ. He's gone back to his old profession because his thing that he was called to do didn't quite work out the way he thought. And he finds himself a pretty lonely fellow. Angry. Probably murmuring all through work. Anyone ever been there? And he's wondering where is Jesus in the midst of his toughest times. But upon seeing that it's the Lord, he jumps out of the boat and he races to and you know he'd have been the first one on scene. The very first one on scene. Now I want you to turn back with me because I promise I get to this before we close. John chapter 18, verse 18. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there. This is, this is right after Jesus is crucified the night of been crucified. And the slaves and the officers were standing there having made a charcoal fire. 
I told you it was mentioned two times in Scripture. This is the other time, or the first time. For it was cold, and they were warming themselves. And Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. And the high priest then questions Jesus about his disciples, about his teaching. Jesus answered, I've spoken openly, and so on, and so on, and so on. And we get to the place in verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. Where? At the charcoal fire. So they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. And I wonder, what's the importance of the fire on the beach that day? And here's the thing I think God wants us to know about our encounter with Jesus. Peter's life started to unravel at that charcoal fire. That was the place where everything started to fall apart. Didn't understand, he was scared. Jesus had just died. He's in full denial, and he's running from the Lord. And God wanted to set a marker where Peter could get his life back on track. And the marker was the same one where he ran from, the charcoal fire. I think it's very significant, that fire on that beach that day. At least to Peter, it was very significant. <clears throat> you see, the charcoal fire represented a time in which he had been following God and stopped. And it signified and marked a time when he wasn't following God and started once again. And I just want you to understand today how important it is to be in the presence of the Lord. It should be our purpose, our very purpose. And I don't know how you came here, but I know how you should leave. And maybe this is your charcoal fire moment. You don't even know why you got here. You grumbled all the way here. You yelled at the family until you opened the door and said, Hey, everybody, we're here. I don't know what the reason is. That happens even to your pastor sometimes. But this is our charcoal fire moment for somebody in this room or somebody's. In just a moment, they're going to come and leave some time to come in. And when they do, I don't want you to hesitate. I want you to flood to the altar if you need to. But it is time, time for being normal or ordinary. Tired of it. You should be tired of it too. God wants your relationship to be extraordinary. It is not going to happen unless the presence of your Savior is what you seek most. Well, listen, I love to come to work most days. I love to serve God most days. There are times when we all find ourselves struggling. And it's that moment where we had better be able to recognize our Savior, even if things in front of us are a bit cloudy. And it was the one who was with him, served him, followed him, trusted in him the most. Remember that for every mile of road you drive, there are two miles of ditch. For every path we walk, there are two miles of ditch along that journey, inviting us to veer, veer off or get ready. I say that my daughter can find me. <laughs> I don't know where she is. I'm dead when I get home. Anyway, I'm, I'm open for lunch offers. <laughs> uh, think about that though for a minute. For every mile God calls us to travel, there are two miles of ditch that are waiting to catch you veering off to the side. Oh, there you are, baby girl. Daddy was just teasing. <laughs> Two miles of ditch. And the devil wants to pull you off one side or the other. He will get you busy. If that doesn't work, he'll get you distracted. If that doesn't work, he'll just flat out lie to you. If the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, God says he's come to bring us life and give it to us in abundance. God's desire is to set that path for you. But you better know the Savior you're looking for and the encounter you're going towards so that you won't get pulled off in them ditches. Because they look good until you have started to go down the side of them. And then you realize it may be too late to get back on track. But if you do, if you're in one of them ditches today, I want you to understand that Jesus is setting that fire for you. He has set a mark for you to come on board and be His. I'm going to ask our worship team to come home and step down here in the front. I don't want you to go home the way you came. If you're struggling, if I've been talking to you, if you know 
that a change is needed in your life. Maybe a simple change. You're walking with the Lord. You're getting things right. You're on the right path. But this is supposed to be your home church. And you haven't made that decision yet. Stop standing on the sidelines. Get involved. Ministry is right there in front of us every day. And God has called you here for a purpose. Maybe you just have some things you need to work on and you don't even need to talk to me, but you just need to come down here and pray. Maybe that stepping out and coming forward is, is a thing that God has inspired you to do because it allows you to kind of seal that commitment in your heart with Him. It's your covenant walk, if you will. Whatever the reason, don't you stay in your seat today comfy and cozy knowing that you're not right with the Lord. If you need to fix something, you come as they lead us in a time of commitment. I'll be right down here in front.